So we do have two wonderful and special guests. We have Allison Broom, who is the mom of Delia Folk, class of 2014. So Delia uh, was a marketing major in undergrad, and she and her mom have partnered to create the company, The Style That Binds Us. Uh, and they are going to uh, share their time and talents with us this evening, evening, and I hope we all walk away with some takeaways. Um, but please do use the chat for your questions. Uh, the format tonight will be, we'll hear a presentation from Allison and Delia. Um, we'll have some opportunity for Q&A. So while they're presenting, if you would like, please pop the questions into the Q&A and they'll be there uh, when it comes time for that session, that segment of the session. And then we have some topics that we know you all will like to talk about amongst one another. So we'll do some breakout rooms as well. So with that, I will toss it to Allison and Delia and say thank you up front very much for sharing your time and talent tonight. And uh, the ball is in your court. Take us away. So introducing the style that binds us, my name is Delia Folk and I interned at Versace and then worked at Barney's on the Bind team for four years and mom is a personal wardrobe stylist and together we are the style that finds us which is a fashion forward lifestyle brand and community for those who want to live a stylish and fearless life. So if you want to live a stylish and fearless life which who wouldn't want to do that then the style that finds us is for you and so that is we have a YouTube channel we have a podcast, we host events, we have a website and a newsletter, a celebrating life after 40 vertical to help age gracefully in style. So everything is under the style that binds us. Mom, do you wanna take it away? Sure, um, so glad to be here with all of you. And I'm not good at the technical aspect of things. So thank goodness I have my daughter as my business partner. But um, tonight we are going to talk about the way you look and the way you present yourself to the world. So a lot of times when I work with women, I do not usually work with like fashionistas, that that's their thing, that that's their, their main thing. And, and you know, that's what their hobby is basically. I usually work with women who are women of substance. They're very busy. They, um, have have some sort of issue that has come to light. Maybe they have changed careers or they've left their career or they're starting a career. There are a lot of reasons uh, why people reach out to me, but the most important thing to, to know is that we are really just talking about how you are presenting yourself to the world. And you have a, a part in that decision. You know, you can control that. And the second thing I want to say is these concepts to all genders, races, sizes, colors. We are inclusive at our very, very core. We have each other's backs. We support our community and women and of course all people, but especially um, women. When I, when I work with my clients, I always tell them, I have your back. And that is um, super important to both Delia and me. All right, now I'm gonna read this. I want you all to listen as I do, enclosed cognition. I don't know if you've ever heard that before, but it is a term that was coined by Adam and Galinsky in their experiment in 2012. It relates to the effect which clothing has upon a person's mental process and the way they think, feel, and function in areas like attention, confidence, or abstract thinking. Recently in the Wall Street Journal, they said, what you wear while working actually matters. Researchers studying in-clothed cognition say your clothing choices at home can affect productivity and performance. That is referring to working from home, but as we all have been living and working from home um, these last few months, you probably have noticed that when you are doing a Zoom or you know, you're on the phone, you're working in your new office that you've set up in the corner of your children's bedroom or whatever, that um, if you take the time to get up, take a shower, put on regular clothes, they don't have to be fancy clothes, but regular clothes, and then you sit down to work, you, you feel more productive already. And um, it is a very interesting me message that scientifically proven that when you are dressed as you would be dressed normally for work 
or for your day, it, it triggers something in your brain that lets you know, okay, it's time to work now. But if you are in your bed, in your sweatpants, and you've got your laptop on your bed and you slept in your bed and you're, you had your coffee in your bed and now you're working in your bed, you know, it just doesn't, it just doesn't feel, feel as good. And another quick example of that is for, I've said this to some of my clients who are moms, if you, especially at the height of COVID, if you come in the kitchen with your kids and you look normal, you have on the clothes that you wear every day, then your kids are going to get the message, oh, mom's okay, we're okay. If you come in the kitchen, you haven't had a shower in three days, your hair is up in a little scrunchy type thing, and you know, you're in your same sweat suit, out, whatever they call it, those kind of clothes that you have been wearing for four days, then they're thinking, things are really bad around here. You know, it's, it's really true. So that's an example of when someone is looking at you. When I went to FIT, we studied in New York, we studied sort of the science behind dressing and what the brain of the person that is looking at you is thinking. And there's a lot of things that um, they're thinking. So that is what we're gonna talk about tonight. All right, do you think your appearance is irrelevant? I know a lot of people do, and a lot of people talk to me, they have complicated things. They have, she's a young professor and she's, she's working with mainly older professors in her department and she doesn't want to dress too young so that, but she wants to appeal to her students, but she doesn't want to dress too old in, in hopes that the, the older um, professors will accept her, but then the students aren't paying attention to her. So it's always these puzzles of like, this, this is my unique um, set of circumstances. So that's the thing, you know, one, one thing doesn't cover all. We are, it's in, in this tonight, we're gonna talk in generalities, but every person is a little bit different. But this is true no matter who you are. Within the first seven seconds of meeting, people will have a solid impression of who you are. And you all do this to other people too. We all do it. We don't mean to do it, but we do it. Some research suggests that a tenth of a second is all it takes to start determining traits, like trustworthiness. Your brain decides within seven seconds if people's are, people are, and this is very interesting to me, high status, trustworthy, charismatic, leadership material, promiscuous, smart, dominant, and successful. And you haven't even spoken a word yet. That's how important what you wear is. And this is another interesting study a year later in 2013. So participants looked at photos of men and they had, they had two men and one of them was wearing a suit that he had gotten at a men's store right off the rack. And the other one was wearing a suit that had been tailored a little bit to fit him. So it almost looked like it was a bespoke suit. They were shown the two pictures of the men and they said, which do you think would be, which one do you, which man do you think is more successful? It's the same thing in an interview, which man would you hire? And they always picked the man with the tailored suit. He could have been much less intelligent. He could have had many less degrees, but the way he looked made the people think, oh, we want him, he's leadership material. He's professional, he's polished, he'll get the job done. So those are some interesting things to sort of prove the fact that your appearance is relevant. Okay, especially for women, as you, you may not realize that you have the power in the way you dress. Sometimes people think that heels are sexist and other women think that heels make them feel powerful, especially if they are in a man's world. A woman um, that I am friends with who was a vice president at Goldman Sachs in New York at a very young age. She also had a boss who was a woman. And the woman said, this is straight to the facts. These are the three things you need to know. Number one, you need to wear heels. That doesn't mean high heels, but she wanted her to, to look polished. Number two, look everyone in the eye. And number three, never bring baked goods, which sounds crazy, but when you think about it, unfortunately, you know, a lot of times, Women are perceived as, oh, they're the sweet ones. They'll get the coffee. They'll bring the donuts. Iris Atfield, who is a woman, she's in her 90s now, and she's sort of a reluctant 
fashion icon and she definitely has a very unique sense of style. You may have seen her before. She wears these big black round glasses and lots of beads and lots of accessories that she's gotten um, as she's traveled the world. But she said something that resonated me. To me, the worst fashion faux pas is to look in the mirror and not see yourself. In other words, if what you're wearing when you look in the mirror, it doesn't match with who you are, then you need to change. Not just change your outfit that day, but change your, um, your look up a little bit. Okay, and another thing about the way you look and how it matters and the message that you're sending people. Imagine this, you are sitting at the desk and you're interviewing someone for a job. Two girls, you have two girls waiting outside. One girl comes in, she's very polished. She, she is well kempt. Her, my nails look horrible because it's COVID, but she doesn't have to have her nails painted, but you know, her nails are clean and um, well-shaped. Her hair is clean. She's wearing something simple and not distracting. And um, she's very calm and sits down and looks you in the eye and introduces herself. Then another scenario would be a girl that comes in who is just, bad, but she's, she's got her, her resume in her folder and they've given her some coffee in the um, waiting area. And so she's coming in and her hair is kind of messed up and she's, she's fumbling and she drops her paper and then she sits down and she's so nice and friendly and, you know, so nice to meet you and everything. But the person who is about to interview those girls has probably already decided which person he's going to hire or she's going to hire because the first person came across as someone who would get the job done again and who would represent the brand of the company best. All right, what do you want to come across with your style in different settings? So what this means is, and also like you don't have to have one style. People always ask that. You don't have to be this girl or that girl. You know, we're not that simple. We are complex creatures. But what you can do that is interesting that you may or may not have thought about is before you go somewhere or start your day, you think about what am I doing today? What conversations am I going to have? Who am I going to be around? And if you have to have a difficult conversation or if you are going to be speaking to a group of people and you want them to sit up and listen, that you want them to take you seriously, then you will do yourself a favor by wearing things with angles, which means pieces of clothing, which lasers, a crisp white blouse, um, jackets, cropped, anything with lines and sort of columns, things like that, pendant necklace, um, things that, that are tailored because they, they're sharp. Um, and that registers with the brain as someone sharp, someone that is an expert. You look like an expert when you're dressed like that. It doesn't have to be a suit. It can just be a blazer or like I said, um, a, a a suit, I mean, a shirt that has crisp edges. So that's one thing. And that also, if you have to have a difficult conversation, you're going into somebody and you, you know, have to tell them some things that, that, you, that you aren't gonna, they're not gonna be happy to hear. Um, then you dress like that. And then if you are in a situation where you want to come across as approachable and is a safe place to land kind of thing then or if you're you know going to be with friends and you're going to dinner or something you want to wear something that is soft that doesn't have sharp edges you want to wear um silky tops like i don't know if you all can see this screen but that top is um it's kind of more silky and i've got on the necklace that i'm wearing right now which is um round instead of like a pendant necklace um, pearls are a good example too, a cashmere type sweater. Anything that is soft makes the person looking at you think, oh, this is a nice, soft, soothing place to, to be. And many, like especially child psychologists do this a lot. They wear things like that so that they don't seem scary. So that is showing you you can set the mood simply by what you're wearing, which I find fascinating. 
what to be careful with at work is with male colleagues and the soft <laughs> curly hair they kind of right well I always I hesitate to talk about this because um you know it's but it is what it is it's a, it's an instinctual thing I think and when I talk to groups of women who work let's say executives in the construction industry or something or the banking industry where there's a you know there are many mo more men most of the time than women, I tell them that um, they need to be particularly careful in what they wear because you don't want people to get distracted. So if you have on perfume and your hair is sort of big and soft and you're wearing a silky blouse, and even if you're wearing a skirt that's down below your knees, you know, and you have on high heels, any of that can be very distracting. So that's when I would go, not necessarily with too many angles because you don't want to appear like you're threatening or coming after their job but you also want to be um you know discreetly dressed and um not too soft not fabrics that someone thinks i'd love to touch that because they do get very distracted you want them to remember what you said not how you looked all right what if you feel like you've lost your unique style or you feel that style doesn't work for you anymore so an example was me. Um, I think when I reached about 40, I'd always worn like little tapered pants to the ankle and a button down and little flats or something sort of like an Audrey Hepburn type look or a Grace Kelly, you know, Jackie O type thing. And I loved that look. And then one day I looked in the mirror and I was like, oh, this is, this is not working so well. I'm, I'm turning into sort of a diamond with these little feet sticking out at the bottom. And also I felt like I was, I just looked frumpy and I didn't know what, you know, I knew what had happened, but I didn't know how to, how to fix that. But I knew that it wasn't working for me anymore. So that is, there are times in your life, just like seasons in your life, when you realize, okay, I'm not the college student anymore. Now I'm a young mom or now I'm a career woman. And then you're like, well, now I'm, my kids are in high school or now I am retiring. You know, all these different times in your life when you might want to, Think about how you dress and, and change it up a little bit. What does it mean to have a personal brand? So sometimes I, I, I'm, always not, I'm not always crazy about saying personal brand because everybody's been talking about branding and branding yourself and branding your company so much. But really basically all it means is you're simply finding the way to physically express who you are through your clothes. You want your inside to match your outside. So that is what building a personal brand really is all about. All right, now we talked about the mood board exercise. Um, I think maybe you received uh, an email about how we do it. I don't know how much time to spend on it right now because we have a lot of things we're doing tonight. So the mood board exercise is a way that you can take some time to figure out yourself what it is at this time in your life right now that makes you happy, that, that gives you, um, you know, that feeling, something that, that, that's, you know, je ne sais quoi pas, I mean, je ne sais quoi pas, whatever, where you, you, you can't even explain it, but it's this immediate reaction when you see it. So if you create a mood board and you take some time to do it where you put all kinds of different things on there, then you walk by and then you walk by again the next day and you start to see patterns like, oh, that color is really, I just kept going to that color over and over again about seven times on this mood board or, oh, I forgot I loved this. Um, I really love this texture. Now, I wonder why I picked that out. Let me think about that. Oh, I forgot. Or, oh, I, now I remember I really loved dance and I haven't danced in so long. What kind of music do I like now? And all of that goes into building your personal brand. And then your clothes, your hairstyle, the amount of makeup or no makeup that you wear, the, um, the things that you surround yourself with in your home, the music you listen to, you know, all of that goes into to really being the most authentic you that you can possibly be. And it's really fun to, you know, when you look in your closet and go, I don't even know is in here. I, I never liked that color and obviously it wasn't anything on my mood board and I love modern art now and all I have in my house is 
you know, as these paintings I've had, you know, half of them since I was a little girl. It's time for me to start branching out and seeing what um, new art resonates with me. So it's really about having an, a reawakening about who you are. That's what the mood board exercise is about. And we can't go through every person's mood board tonight, obviously. But um, if you haven't done it, hopefully you'll take some time and do it, maybe over the weekend, sometime like that. And another thing that's interesting too is in the beginning when you start doing it, if you have kids or a significant other or just roommates, whoever that are in your life, they'll come in and go, what are you doing? You know, they'll think you're, you know, you're tearing things out of a magazine or you're, you know, taping things and pinning things to a board. What in the world? And, you know, at first, you know, for you to say, well, I'm making a mood board. They, you know, you might feel kind of foolish, but usually what happens is the other people around you usually say, wait, how does that work? You know, and then if you say, well, you, why don't you do it too? And then they start doing it. And then it can even become like a family activity. It's, um, you can go outside and find leaves and, you know, things from nature, just all kinds of things. Um, and the process of it, the mental process is bringing you back to your, also giving you permission to, to, to play. Okay. So now Q and A. So let's see if we have questions, you can type them into the chat. I have a question to launch us here. So I would, I would like to present myself as both a leader and someone who can be trusted and is accessible. How do I balance those two things? Well, are you also working with people of all ages? Yes, indeed. Yes. And sex is in all the above. So I think that um, you, you need to wear what is the most comfortable for you in a polished way. Since you represent the school, you have to keep that in mind. You also have to keep in mind that um, you don't need to wear, I wouldn't think, um, being on a campus, I don't know that you would need to wear, you know, obviously suits and things like that. Maybe you do sometimes, and certainly if you speak in front of a group, that might be a good idea. Or even a blazer and a, and a blouse, you know, with some um, trousers, um, you know, and a boot or something like that, a booty or, or, or something like that. Something that is in between the two. And when you have certain times when you have to speak or take people on tours, or I don't know what all you do, but um, things like that, then that is gonna be stepped up a little bit. Another thing, um, and I don't know, or it doesn't matter to me how any of you feel about Dr. Um, Deborah Burks, but I was very interested in the way she dressed in the beginning of the day, you know, the beginning days of COVID because she did not wear a suit. She did not dress in a stern, austere way, but she dressed in a professional way. She usually had on a blouse, a silk blouse, or even a sweater, but she always had that scarf around her neck and her hair pulled back. And it was almost like your sort of chic, science-minded mother was speaking to you or you know, another person. She was an expert. She looked polished and clean, but a bit of softness to her look because we were all terrified. We had no idea what was happening. So that's an example, and that'd be a good look for you sometimes too, or you know, maybe with a really pretty um, scarf, something like that. And then like what you were wearing tonight, I think that's perfect. Lydia says, what about if you were a serious financial leader in the arts? Do you plan to dress soft and artsy or sharp and financially minded? Yes, that's a very good question too. And I've had this question with like an advertising executive, things like that too. Um, I would say you're an executive, so you need to be polished. But I would definitely say if you're going to wear like a blazer, find a blazer that has a cool print, an interesting print or beautiful like silk type shirt that has a lovely print, something that is a little bit, you know, has a little bit of creative creativity 
foot or, you know, interesting bangles or, or something that, um, or a beautiful cape or, you know, a long cardigan. There's a lot of things you can do, um, you know, that, that are professional, but um, interesting. And I think if you're in the arts that it, you know, you can, you can be a little creative with that. Okay, and Alexandra, the jacket, this one is Prada. We do work in fashion, and a lot of times we shop consignment, or when I worked at Barney's, we had this magical discount. So that is Prada. But it's Prada, but it's probably, you know, from 1980. I have no idea yeah. when it, I found it in a consignment shop in New York City, and that's another thing to talk about, too. Consignment shopping, we think it's a great idea. We also think that don't ever go in to any consignment thinking, um, I need a blazer, I need a sweater. It, it, it's like a treasure hunt. You go in there and, you know, that, that jacket obviously jumped out at me. And really, in all the time I've shopped consignment, I probably have seven things that are treasures. That, that jacket, then there's another one that's like this Dolce & Gabbana car coat that's amazing. And then... There's just a few other things like that. That's the kind of thing I would get in consignment. I'd get some fabulous statement piece that you're going to wear the rest, literally you'll wear it the rest of your life. Um, I feel like, wasn't there a consignment shop in Williamsburg that we went to, Delia? I feel like there was. I know there was, but I can't remember exactly where it was. It wasn't near. But anyway, we, we think that's a great way. It's a good way to um, practice sustainability and... Um, to consign and to be, you know, to shop. Okay, Joe says, what about colors? I have heard red is not good with men. It comes across as a man hater. It's hysterical. <laughs> well, it's prob part of that is probably um, depending on who's wearing it because it depends on what the, th what the outfit looks like too. Like what Delia's wearing is, you know, orangey red and I don't think that would be something that men would hate. I think if you're wearing, um, you know, it would have to be, I would say something that's not super tailored if it were red. But the good thing about red, if you choose the right red for you, it, the light bounces from the red up onto your face. And so it makes your comp complexion look really pretty. And um, there's a blue red for people that have cool undertones. And then there's orangey red have warm undertones and for someone like me if I were to red it makes me look like I have gray circles under my eyes so you have to be very careful about which red you choose but I don't think it's I don't think I, I, I don't think my husband would hate it if I wore red no I feel like it's powerful and sexy I say go for it but like powerful and or sexy it's not doesn't it's not always sexy so you can wear I would totally present to a room of males in red right right that would be fun. Okay. I, I think so too. I think about like Valentino and these other people that um, their whole color, you know, their whole persona was around that red kind of thing. So I guess there's, there's something to it. Anna. Okay. So we call each other <laughs> Phoebe, B-E-B-E. -B -E, and it's a weird thing that happened in, in high school <laughs> and they drove the family crazy. And now hopefully they, they're used to it do we always get along? We always get along. She frustrates me a bit and I'm sure she gets annoyed with me or whatever, but we are together a lot, but it is a joy getting to work together and all the adventures we've gone on. <laughs> I mean, she doesn't ask me the question that she really should know the answer to, especially about technology. Yes, okay. I think we're patient with her. Yeah, I could, I could be more patient for sure. Okay. Paige, BB. She's saying, how do you work with someone from Illinois? Does it require travel? She's 51, but look younger. She wants to be seen as experienced yet creative. She's a sales leader in the insurance industry. So talk about how you work with clients maybe. Okay, so I can't see that question. So did she say she's 51, but she wants to look younger? Well, I think she does look younger. It doesn't say she wants to. I think she does. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm I'm 51, but most people guess me to be like early 40s. So I have that mix of needing to be taking seriously, uh, and I have a ton of experience. So I want to look right. mature, right. sophisticated, but also 
um, you know, attractive and powerful and all that. Right. Sure. So, yeah. absolutely. So, it's on you know, who you're meeting with, who you're talking with. If you are um, in a situation, you know, where you're going to be in meetings all day and things like that, I think that you can either pull your hair back or um, wear it in a style that's, you know, that's a little bit polished and your clothes are a little bit, um, you know, not, not too there's not too much going on. There's not a lot of pattern and everything. It's a little more um, understated. And then when you are out and about and you are happy that people think you look like you're 40, because you do, you can have your hair, you know, like it is tonight where it's so pretty and you can wear fun um, colors and pattern and things like that and great earrings and, um, and look fabulous. Okay, and the way, so yes, it can be virtual. Um, Mom works with clients virtually. She does, she does personal shopping. So like, kind of like this, you talk about, okay, what is, what, what are we going for? What are we dressing for? Do you have your core wardrobe, which is the secret to getting dressed easily? Basically, if you have those core pieces that you need, and then from there, you can add in the fun pieces, but then it makes a workable wardrobe for you. So you're getting to mix and match, and it's super easy to get dressed. You don't have to think about it. And then special occasion dressing, any brides, mother of the groom, all of that going on a trip, like, you know, what do people wear in Austin? What do people wear in Rome? That's not maybe happening so much now, but going forward, it can. So the, the appointments can be in person or online. Did I miss anything? Right. And this is a, a question. No, no, you were great. I saw someone said, what day is talking about? So there's some crazy things about patterns and prints have to do with the pattern of your textures of your hair have to do with the best fabrics that you put on your body, all of these kinds of things. But those are the things that you have to do in a one-on-one -on -one appointment. And that's what I was talking about because the patterns that would work for Joe would not work for Laura. Um, the colors don't, you know, the size of the patterns. So it gets to be a very um, specific, it gets down to all these pieces of the puzzle that come together in a one-on-one -on -one appointment to create the perfect look. Um, so yeah, I, I, the next time I go see my client in DC, I need to go to Current Boutique. That's fabulous. Okay, Denise says, at, right. what, at what point does a signature item like Dr. Burke's scarves become a cliche? I think it never. Bibi, what do you think? No, I don't think it. I'll tell you the thing about scarves that's very important, and I think she did a good job about that too. So a lot of times people have all these scarves. We go in, we pick out the scarf, and then they say, how do I do it? And then they go take a picture so I'll know just how to wear it. But a scarf does not wear you. You, you wear a scarf. Okay, so scarf might be worn in the morning one way, in the afternoon a completely different way. It depends, let's say in the morning you're very cold, so you have on your jacket and you wrap your scarf tightly around your neck. And then when you get to the office or to wherever you're going, you take off the coat and, and then it gets warmer, so then you loosen the scarf a little bit. And then it gets chilly again. So then you're, at one point you get really hot and you just take the scarf off and wrap it up, put it in your purse. Then it's starting to get chilly again, air conditioning's coming on, whatever it is. Then you start working with your scarf again. And then that night when you go to dinner, you don't have your jacket on and you put your scarf in a little more loose way. So the scarf has a function and a purpose. It's not just for adornment and it is not just one way to wear it. If you are nervous because your scarf is not exactly the way it should be, it's gonna be distracting to you and to other people. And also it will become stayed. It will become that, you know, same look all the time. Different lengths worn different ways. I don't think it becomes old. And it can kind of be, you love, you know, beautiful scarves. Okay. Any tips for short people right. who, right, can you hear me? Any tips for short people who want to wear heels 
except whenever she thinks that's a problem, the tiny powerhouse, she thinks of RBG. And uh, don't give it another thought. You, okay, any tips for short people who don't want to wear heels? It's okay if you don't want to wear heels. Who do wear heels? Oh no, if you don't want to, it's fine. Yeah. No, I think it's totally fine. I think that, can you hear me, Delia? Yep. I think that it, a lot of my shorter clients always wear heels or always wear platform shoes. It just makes them, that's just what makes them happy. But then there are certainly my short clients that wear flats only, and that's totally fine too. Absolutely. Own it, wear it, be comfortable, be chic. Um, you know, depending on what size you are, what coloring you are, all of that goes into what you would put together, but never feel bad about wearing flats. You are, you know, small and mighty. Absolutely. <laughs> Tiny and fabulous. <laughs> yeah, Bobby Brown's teeny. There are a lot of very powerful women that are small. Okay, Jen B says, I'm returning to the workforce after more than 20 years. Back in the day, I was all about the suits with blazers because I wanted to fly up the professional ladder. I'm yeah. in a different place now and don't want to look like the same young go-getter. I want to be seen as dependable and hardworking. I've been struggling with finding interview clothes. We did a YouTube video about this, what to wear for a virtual interview, and clothes I can transition to working. What do you suggest? I'm looking for jobs in accounting. Yeah, so I hear this all the time. And um, it's funny because pantsuits have come back but I don't know, they were really going to be big this year, but I don't, you know, I think we missed the mark on that one. So um, the, the, the difference there is the same pants that they're putting forward right now. But I would take, um, take your blazers from those suits and put them on and they feel dated. You know, if you're size two oversized and clients that are going through this, they had these like Armani suits from the 80s and they were so proud of those suits so they never got rid of them because they were Armani and expensive on them. But when they put on like, clearly this isn't the way it fit me before. You know, it looks like they're wearing a man's jacket. But if you can find some blazer that like, instead of wearing them with a matching pant or skirt, with a, like a turtleneck or a button down type silk blouse, something like that. And um, you can just wear it with a nice black pant and a loafer or um, something that's comfortable for you if you're gonna be working in the office. One idea, um, cardigans. So the thing anymore. So that if you, or in a situation where you want to wear a suit and put on some heels and you know people go wow then we're all for that for sure but also if you want to take it down a notch you can do something soft and then have a jacket over it and you can take the jacket on and off same as you would do with a scarf but that's what i would recommend and if none of those blazers or jackets or anything fit right correctly, then don't do just, you know, give them to a consignment shop and go out and get a few nice third layer pieces. So we also did a YouTube video that's all about the core wardrobe and you can print out um, a piece of paper where you literally check off the things you have and the things you need. Because if you have those core pieces, then all you have to go out and buy is a new really good, really pretty um, polished looking cardigan. Not one necessarily that's real big and flowy and oversized like a cushion. That, that wouldn't be for work, you know, but a, a good looking cardigan possibly and a blazer or two, plaid blazer, you know, little jackets, whatever it is that fits you best. Those um, pieces pulled together have a modern, dressy, casual, but elegant 
I'm an executive at a software company, so lots of men and very casual. In person, I tend to dress conservatively. With remote learning, I have expressed more femininity. Headbands, great jewels, or, oh, or is that okay? Or stick as is in person? That's interesting because we talked about the interview for um, Zoom interviews for jobs. One of the interviews that I was talking about was for tech. So, um, you know, in tech, it seems like everybody wears a black turtleneck everywhere. <laughs> I think you definitely need to have one of those. Um, on Zoom, it depends on who you're, who you're on the Zoom call with. So I would, I know we keep telling you to do now when we can't work one-on-one -on -one with somebody. So we did a YouTube video specifically about jewelry for Zoom. So uh, you can learn like when you're in a business call, maybe this style earring, um, and then you're, you know, when you're having a happy hour or you're, you know, something like this, you can do um, a more fun type earring. I would stick to understated, on the zoom calls but if you could just do like a black turtleneck but then you could do kind of some kind of cool statement earring headbands i think are fabulous just um you know not like garden party type headlands uh, headbands that are floral or something like that so still think about you know tech is not super warm and fuzzy when you think about it on the brain um you want to look very um i if it were me I would want to look very chic, but casual. I would want to look like I had it going on. I wouldn't want to look sloppy casual, even though maybe a lot of the other people around me were. Even if you did a hoodie and a t-shirt, like a cute hoodie, they make a ton of hoodies now. They're like little cashmere type hoodies. That, you know, and a gold hoop earring, something like what I would do. Okay, so I'm putting links to all these YouTube videos. Um, okay. I think we even have a, do we have the a shop site cardigans? We just try and, I know what people should do. Go to the website and then there's a shop where you can see what we've, some of it is for holiday gift guides of Amazon. Everybody's got a order holiday things early, but then there's also um, a um, in those, go to the blogs and it'll tell you about the YouTube video. I think we did one for like plugins for work and, you know, different, just all kinds of different ways to help people as for Zoom as for, for life. How did you and your mom decide to go into business together? It was organic. It just kind of happened. She wasn't about it because we are from the South. I grew up in Alabama and the mother daughter thing she didn't want to do like a mommy and me thing we we're serious like we we're not just influencers you know we started we have careers in fashion and then separately we started blogs mom to answer the style questions and then i was talking about how i got into the industry what is it like when you're in it and introducing people to emerging brands when people would see us together they would say wow you have such an incredible relationship and dynamic why aren't you doing something together? There's not a mother daughter in this space. So finally, after enough times of people saying that she gave in and she, she decided we could do it. <laughs> That's it, awesome. It took some convincing. All right, Telia and Allison, thank you so, so much. The activity in the Q and A, I think tells us a great deal about the value of the content you were bringing us. So. Thank you so much. Um, really appreciate it. And thanks to everyone who joined us tonight. Uh, I know Delia and Allison are open for um, additional interaction with them. So check out their website. And there's a ton of resources on their website that are available to, to the world. So please check that out. And I'd like to close with two thank yous. One to the Society of 1918, the 481 women who have funded the Alumni Initiatives Endowment at the level of $4.3 million that helps to underwrite programming like this. So thank you, Society of 1918 members. Um, and thank you certainly to Allison and Delia for sharing your time and talents tonight. 
So with that, I hope you all have enjoyed your appetizer and your favorite beverage at arm's length and that you have a wonderful evening um, for the rest of tonight. So thanks so much to all. And again, thank you, Delia and Allison. Thank Everyone you. have a good night. Bye. Bye. Thank you for having us. All right. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.